job entails. And you, and, uh, you send to a case study. Thank you, Minister. Firstly, I, I must apologize for the format of the case study. It's not in the best format. I, I did it um, in a rush yesterday because it was the only time I had. So apologies for that in advance. Uh, um, with regard to the case study, clearly there are a whole lot of role players, um, key role players that the National Director would need to engage with um, during his or her tenure. and. Let's deal with them, you know, one by one. Um, well, let me deal with it holistically. You have a situation where it appears that there's, um, that there's an investment banker that's in South Africa that has ulterior motives, um, and it looks like he wants to infiltrate state security. Um, the first thing with regard to um, Advocate Nguenya, who's the Deputy National Director, who would give the National Director this information, um, I would meet with the Deputy National Director in order to get all the information with regard to the evidence that he has that leads him to conclude that there's a case that he would like to bring fairly quickly. Um, with regard to, to Bridget Smith, who's the policy person in the office, um, I would listen to her because I think it's really important as prosecutors that we understand the greater context. Um, prosecutorial decisions cannot be taken in a vacuum. So from her perspective, she feels that if we do prosecute, she is a member of the National Director's Office, but she feels that if we do prosecute, it could have an impact on the economy of the country. So for the National Director, it's important to understand what the impact of his or her decisions would be. It does not mean, and it should not mean, and it will not mean if I am the National Director, that that will influence the decision itself. But it's important to understand what the impact is, how to manage the decision, including, for example, the timing of, of publishing or announcing a decision. These are important factors that you as a National Director have to consider. So I would listen to, to the policy person, Ms. Smith, and understand the broader context. Um, so with regard to, to the, the minister, um, if you'll just allow me to refer to her situation, um, it's clear from the background that we have in the um, information that we got is that the minister is someone who is um, keen to um, develop relationships within the cluster. Um, she is actually keen to, to make things happen, so to speak, and very supportive of holding and bringing people to justice. And she is keen to meet with the national director. With regard to, to the minister, um, I would write to the minister. Obviously, the minister is a very, you know, the national director would require to report to the minister, so it's important that that relationship between the national director and the minister is, is really uh, a one of understanding, a one of cooperation, um, because the national director and the minister will need to work very, very closely together. And of course, the national director would has certain reporting obligations to the minister. So that relationship is crucial. So it would be uh, what the national director would need to do is to meet with the minister, 
um, to welcome the initiative to hear what she has to say about this particular case, what evidence that she has about it. Um, as I said, the National Director will understand her keenness to want to proceed with the case, but as a National Director you would listen, but you would know that you would not be taking instructions from the, from the Minister, but that is important to hear what information she has about this case. Um, you would understand that the Minister has final responsibility over the prosecuting authority, as I explained. The Act sets out the way in which the National Director is expected to report, and that is um, Section 33 of the NPA Act. Um, the Minister also wants you to sign a performance contract with her. Um, that will be a little bit awkward because you will need to explain to the Minister that in as much as um, you would report to her and, and uh, be happy to meet to discuss specific issues, but that the independent mandate of the, the, the National Director um, means that there's no performance contract signed between the National Director and the Minister. And so that's going to be a difficult and tricky uh, conversation. But um, I think that given that the Minister seems to be a person that um, is aligned to the values of ensuring that the independence of the prosecution is maintained, that's the impression I get, I think it will be a, a discussion that we need to have and, and make that clear that in as much as you know, the National Director is prepared to report according to the requirements of the Act, um, there's no performance assessment, um, performance contract that would be signed between in order to protect the independence of the prosecutor or the National Director, which is guaranteed both in the Constitution and in Section 179 of the, of the NPA Act, um, which requires that the prosecutor acts without fear, favor, or prejudice. Um, so with regard to the uh, DG, the response to the DG, um, this is another, the DG is, is again another important uh, stakeholder, and I think I want to express, uh, I want to emphasize at this stage the fact that it's crucial that the necessary stakeholders in government work very, very closely together. So in as much as the National Director would have to be very, very firm about ensuring that the independence of the office is absolutely clear and guaranteed, you also need to be able to manage those relationships because the National Director, him or herself, is not going to solve the, the problems that we know exist in this country. The National Director is going to require incredible cooperation from a whole range of stakeholders and not just people within government, and I'm digressing a little bit, but even, you know, Section 9 institutions that are mentioned, for example, the Auditor General's Office, for example, the Public Protector's Office, that have been instrumental in dealing with so many of the issues in the recent past in our country. It's going to be crucial that the National Director actually, in addition to the role players that are mentioned in the case study, has extremely good relationships with those other Section 9 institutions that are mentioned um, in, in the Constitution. Um, so getting back to the, to the DG, um, it will, it will, the DG obviously from, from the case study seems to be someone that is keen to do his job properly. He wants to do the right thing. He wants to make sure that there's a clean audit report, which is really important. But on the other hand, he needs to understand that he cannot actually determine how the National Director makes decisions with regard to resources in particular cases. And therefore, you would have to be polite but clear and explain to him that this is how the relationship works. And so that would be really important. The DG is the accounting officer uh, for the um, NPA. Um, I, I would, if I was the National Director, the National Director would um, have discussions with the DG about whether this is the best construction at the moment and whether perhaps there shouldn't be a situation where the national director or someone within his or her staff is actually the accounting officer in order, I think, to ensure absolute independence of the office of the national director. I think it's important that there is that degree of separation with regard to the accounting officer and the national director. So I would inform him 
that we should perhaps have, have some discussions around this relationship and also discuss it with the minister um, and see how we could actually make sure that that works to ensure and protect um, above all the, the independence of the Office of the National Director. Um, I refer to section 32 of the NPA Act, um, which states that the prosecutor will act um, with impartiality, without fear, favor, or prejudice. And also section 32 refers to the fact that no organ or state or member or employee of an organ or state or any other person shall improperly interfere with, hinder, or obstruct the prosecuting authority or any member thereof in the exercise of his or her, her in the performance of his or her functions or duties. So section 36 of the NPA Act is also relevant in this regard. Um, with regard to Alfred Causa, he seems like a bit of a difficult character. Um, given the tone of his letter, he's, um, he's clearly uh, quite an aggressive person. Um, that being so, I think it will be necessary to take somewhat firm stance but it's also important to know that, um, so you've got to explain to him what the national director's prerogative is in terms of independent decision making. But at the same time, you also need, the national director also needs to work with state security. So in the circumstances, um, I would think that it would be good for the national director to have a meeting with the minister. departments um, to come together, together with Mr. Koza and the National Director to try to iron out and for, for, the, for, the, for Mr. Koza to clearly understand what the, the ambit and the functions of the, of the Office of the National Director is, particularly with regard to um, independent decisions, but also Chapter 3 of the Constitution really talks about cooperative government. And that's really important that we stress that it's important, and if you just read some of, some of these sub-paragraphs there, it talks about fostering friendly relations, cooperating with one another in mutual trust and good faith, um, coordinating actions, um, avoiding legal proceedings. He does threaten legal proceedings in, in this particular letter. So I think it will be important to remind him uh, quite firmly about the fact that um, we need to work together. Um, with regard to the to the anonymous um, letter um, that uh, the national director receives uh, regarding the conduct of one of the prosecutors, um, it would be important to call in the deputy national director under whom this particular prosecutor is working and to tell him about the information that you've received uh, to then get in the prosecutor concerned and to speak to him about the information and if he um, accepts or admits that the conversation took place uh, and gives some kind of explanation about it, um, there will be disciplinary actions. I think it's important to know the, the facts here is that he was sitting in a, a jazz club, that's the prosecutor, and speaking to certain people about this very, very sensitive case involving Ivano, Ivanovich, sorry, that's not the right name, but involving this, this person. Um, so, you know, they say loose lips sink ships. It's really, really important that people keep quiet about confidential information. Otherwise, there could be dramatic and drastic consequences. Um, it, in the context of, for example, witnesses could be put at, at risk. People could die. It's so important for prosecutors to understand that when they are investigating highly sensitive cases, that they need to ensure that their egos take a back seat and not want to talk about these great cases that we, we are dealing with, but to really ensure that the integrity of that particular case is protected at all costs. So confidentiality obligations, which is also referred to in the Code of Conduct of the Prosecutors, is hugely important. So in this particular context, given that the prosecutor concerned has had previous, um, previous um, transgressions with regard to certain behavior, behavioral issues, um, it would be um, 
you know, it, it may well be that you may have to take quite drastic action because he's been warned before. So disciplinary sanctions, depending on the, on, on the relevant facts, would be absolutely essential in that case. If the anonymous prosecutor comes forward and there's more evidence about what exactly the prosecutor was communicating to these people about, then it may well be, depending on the severity of that, that it would call for the dismissal of the prosecutor concerned. But it all would all depend on the facts. Again, here, the, the NPA code of conduct would, would have relevance, as well as the UN guidelines on the role of the prosecutor, which is referred to in the code of conduct of the prosecutors, which um, in 1998 or 1999, I was also involved in the drafting of the code of conduct here, as well as the code of conduct at the International Criminal Court. Um, with regard to, to Mrs. Govender, the admin person at the KZN office of the, of the DPP, um, I would agree to meet with her. The national director should agree to meet with her. And if I am that person, then meet with her and, and, and get a sense of what's going on, because I think it's really important for the national director to be involved and in touch with people on the ground to fully understand what is going on um, in the institution. Um, so I would meet with, with the lady and find out what exactly um, the issues are. Um, but for the first one, which is a managerial issue about staff coming late, the other uh, allegations that she mentions are quite serious, and therefore it would require, um, initially as a national director, the first thing would be to, to discuss it with the DPP um, of Kwasul and Tell. Um, it seems like uh, the DPP in this case, if I recall, is also there's some allegations against the DPP himself. So it would require perhaps in this case, again the code of conduct of the, of the prosecutor would, uh, um, would be relevant. Um, but in this case, it may require the integrity office of the NPA. When I was here 10 years ago, I know there was an integrity office. I'm not sure if it still is, is there, but I think that there may well be a role for the integrity office to look into the conduct uh, or to look into what's going on in that office. And it may, even be, uh, it may even be necessary to get the police involved to investigate the issue with regard to the disappearance of dockets because it could well be that there may be some aspects of corruption um, that's taking place with regard to the sale of, of the dockets. And certainly a, a national director of public prosecutions should have absolutely zero tolerance for corruption and that will have to be dealt with very, very, very seriously. And then finally, we have the, the issue of the, um, the response to the president. Um, I will write to the president, of course, and, and express my ap appreciation for the opportunity to meet with him um, and to listen to him with regard to what his expectations are uh, concerning the, the office of the NDPP. Uh, it will already be clear, because in the event that I am offered this position, I would only take it on condition of a guarantee of absolute independence of the office of the prosecutor. And so if that, those guarantees are made, the president would, well, would have known about this um, and the fact that the national director acts with, with absolute independence with regard to, to his or her decisions. But of course, it's important to understand what the expectations of the national director would be. And given the, the, the description of the president in the case study, it appears that in all probability, the, the, um, the ideas with regard to the national director's expectations, as well as the national director, if it's me, would be pretty aligned. And so I think that would be useful, but to hear the expectations of the national director. With regard to his case, um, sorry, the case of the Russian banker, um, the national director is concerned um, that it might impact on the um, economy of the country in that South Africa is trying to secure investments from those particular regions and that a prosecution of this person could ac actually hamper those. Um, the good thing here is that I would have spoken to the policy person in, in the office of the national director already and got a sense of what her thinking is about the impact of this, this decision. Um, I would. I would listen to the national uh, sorry to the president, um, and listen to the impact that the decision could make, and then come to some sort of agreement, reasonable agreement, about how the 
the, the decision could be managed. The decision will never change. The decision to prosecute will not change. But it's really important for the national director to understand that the NDPP does not take decisions in the vacuum, that they are in, that there could be impact of decisions. And therefore, for example, the timing of a decision or the management of a decision is really important. So it would, for example, give the president some time to, to, to prepare the groundwork and to, 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 to be able to manage the decision. But he will understand that that decision is going to be taken and that decision will be implemented. This will have absolutely no impact on the implementation of that decision. But it's important that there's that kind of understanding between the national director and the, um, and the, the president. So those are my responses to the, um, the case study. Good afternoon. It's not too bad. I upgraded to business class at my own cost, so <laughs> it's not too bad. I had about four hours of sleep. You mentioned the word absolute independence. Yes. Yes. Sure, thank you. And as you started your question, I realized that, Minister, you had some very specific areas that you outlined. And I went through the case study and didn't touch on that. But I'll touch on those areas as, as we continue with, with the interview, if that's OK. So um, I think with regard to, to operational independence, um, the, the, the Office of the National Director of Public Prosecutor, um, there will, of course, be attempts to from various quarters to influence the national director in his or her decision making. And this could come from, from individuals, um, it could come from politicians, it could come from um, ordinary um, persons, it could come from um, certain uh, political parties. Um, it, so there's a range of ways in which the, the, the national director could be tried uh, persons could try to influence a national director. And I think it's, it's really important for the national director to actually ensure that in all his or her engagements with persons at any level, because you are going to have to cooperate with individuals, that you as a national director understand that irrespective of what or who the individual is and what these people bring to the table, that your decision cannot be influenced in any way by um, any of these individuals. I'll give you, for example, an, an, an example of independence and why it is so important from, from my perspective. The Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, independence is a really important principle that uh, the office, that the court is actually one of the key principles of the court. And so the independence of the Office of the Prosecutor is fiercely defended at that level because there are, there are states parties to the Rome Statute, there are individuals that want to influence the prosecutor in some or other way with regard to the way in which she makes her decisions. And she constantly makes it very clear, and working with her in the office of the prosecutor, we always ensure that cases are decided upon purely on the evidence before 
the prosecutor at a given time. And nothing else will influence the decision making but the evidence before the prosecutor. So there, were, there was an instance at the International Court when the states were actually setting up an oversight mechanism. Um, and so there was a tension between oversight of the prosecutor's office and account and independence on the other hand. And so the, the office, and I was one of those persons that actually had to engage with states to fiercely defend the position of the office of the prosecutor. And I think that's also important in terms of the office of the NDPP, that there has to be accountability, hugely important. But on the other hand, you've got to ensure that that doesn't encroach on your operational independence in any way, and that the evidence is the only thing that drives your decision making. With regard to the financial issues, um, I'm not quite sure how the system works with regard to the DG actually trying to secure resources for the national director. But if that is the case, then obviously you have another party that is trying to put forward the case for the national director in terms of securing resources. And it would be the national director that would be best placed to actually uh, plead his or her case for resources for whatever the issues may be. So I think that it, if, because it would be so important for a person, the national director, you're fighting your own case, so to speak, I think you would be able to actually uh, try to get more resources. Um, and I'm not saying that the DG would not do the job properly, but it's just that it's in terms of human conduct, when it relates to you, you know you understand the scenario, and I think that it would actually enhance the system if the national director or his or her representative is able to make that plea for additional resources. Right. So you perhaps agree with me then that if you look at the combination of those two elements that make up for the independence of the institution, it's unlikely to be absolute. It's unlikely to be? Absolute. Absolute. absolute because of the, the way it's currently... Yeah, the fact that you are possibly fully in control of your operational environment and the decisions that you make, but the, decision, but the resources that come into your institution to effect those decisions are not fully in your control. Absolutely, I agree with you, because it is the same situation that we face at the, at the International Criminal Court, is because the states give you a particular resource, and then you have to actually do your work in line with what those resources are. And the demand for your services is much greater than what your resources are. No, so, no, yes, absolutely, I agree. Right, let's deal with the next point now. Uh, in your history within the, the NBA before you left, as well as when you, where you are now with the ICC, have there been any instances where your credibility and integrity was called into question? Yes. There was one instance, and that's when I didn't pay a traffic fine. Um, it certainly impacted on my credibility, and then it came called into question. And and um, would you like me to talk about that? Okay. So um, the situation in that particular case was that I had I was on official business, um, and there was an urgency about the the work that I was doing. I was actually going to the far um, northern part of KwaZulu Natal, um, and I was. Um, in my sort of concentration about the business at hand, I didn't realize that the it was in some in the small roads on the outskirts, not in the, in the main roads, uh, the freeways, so to speak. I didn't realize that the, the speed limit had actually dropped, and that I would had gone over the speed limit. I got a ticket, um, and as generally, persons who receive speeding fines actually make representations to prosecutors or to the director of public prosecutions. Given that I was in that position, I was not able to make representations to myself. So I made representations to the national director and explained to him the situation. Um, and he agreed that the charges be withdrawn. But for, cert for reasons, the charges were not withdrawn. And the case landed up on the um, court roll. And so, you know, that's the situation. And I'm really, um, I, it, people can be justifiably annoyed about that. Nobody is above the law. And, um, you know, if, if that is something that is important enough to, to, um, 
to affect the, the decision with regard to the appointment of the national director, then so be it. I accept that that is um, something that, but certainly a, a big lesson learned. Thank you. Um, if you look closely at the NBA documents, Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Service excellence, yes. The, the, national, the National Prosecuting Authority have, has a fantastic vision, and that's justice in our society so that people can live in freedom and security. And, but I think now there needs to be, in addition to that, a new vision. And the vision that I think simply for the NPA should be to create confidence in the NPA in the eyes of the public. And I think that has got to be what drives everything that the National Director does. If we can ensure that the NPA has credibility and trust as far as the public is concerned, then I think we've come a long way. And the things as national director, if I'm appointed, that I would concentrate on, what, what does this entail? What do you have to do? Firstly, we talked about the independence, and I think I can stand here and talk and say I will be independent if I'm the national director, but only the independent decision-making will actually show. It's only the actions of the national director that will instill that confidence in the public and not me simply saying that if I'm the national director, I will act with independence. So the acts of the national, it will be really important to ensure that independent decisions are made and the public can see that. There must be really strong governance principles, crucial, important, respect for the rule of law. I cannot underestimate how important it is that we respect the rule of law. If we do not respect the rule of law, the country is on a slippery slope. And so it's hugely important that the rule of law is respected at all times. Governance principles of transparency, maybe as the NDPP you need to look at, at uh, giving decisions for certain decisions you take or don't take. Um, so that people understand to the extent that you can and you don't uh, infringe any confidentiality obligations or if there are ongoing investigations, you certainly cannot compromise those. But I think it's important that the Office of... And that will also talk to accountability of the, of the National Prosecuting Authority. Oh, so, so I'll continue. Um, so, so strong governance principles, hugely important. Uh, ethical conduct is something, and I almost think that maybe one of the measures of the National Prosecuting Authority should be how much of confidence does the people of South Africa have in the National Prosecuting Authority. And I think that is going to be really important in terms of moving forward. Ruthlessly against corruption, uh, the National Prosecuting Authority Act still, I think it's, I think it's Section 7, still makes provision for the creation of investigating directorates. And I think this is something that will also give confidence to the, to the public is if the National Director creates an investigating directorate dealing specifically with corruption and have together with, with have a multidisciplinary task team. And so it would again mean working, the President will obviously have to approve this, all the stakeholders in the justice sector would be involved in this. And you have expertise from, for example, the Auditor General's office, um, you look at um, there may be people in the private sector that might, might want to contribute. This is going to be all hands on deck to deal with, with corruption. And so we must all try to do what we can. So if we create the investigation directorate, even though people in the private sector may, may, may contribute, and let me make this very clear, it's got to be about giving without accepting anything in return. And that has got to be crucial. So pe people have got to understand it's about giving for the sake of helping the country. And so I think that would be hugely important. Um, there needs to be um, a, a strong team um, around us, um, around the national director. Um, the, Na the National Prosecuting Authority can't tackle corruption alone. And I think I've dealt with this earlier, so I won't repeat myself. But it has to be a multidisciplinary uh, approach with, with the various uh, parts of government working together. 
um, civil society, for example, I cannot, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of civil society in the, in the, in the years preceding. Uh, civil society played a really important role in ensuring that you know they, there were certain key cases that were taken to court. That respect for the rule of law, um, you know, they fought for these things. I think it's hugely important that that uh, relationship uh, be strengthened, and so that um, I think at the end of the day, it would be um, you know I, I could stand here and say a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the public has confidence in the National Prosecuting Authority. I think trust and confidence, that would be uh, something that we can say the National Prosecuting Authority is now, um, it's now on the road to being where it was at one stage. I was a very proud prosecutor and prosecutors were proud and majority of the prosecutors today are still those committed prosecutors but unfortunately because of what's going on in the NPA and we all know what's going on, um, it's, a, it's a mess for want of a better word. And, I was at the um, I was at the um, Independent Asso uh, Prosecutors Association meeting uh, in in Johannesburg, wearing my ICC hat about a month ago, and I met a number of prosecutors there, and and the the picture is an extremely gloomy one. So I think there's going to be a, that's an internal aspect, and I haven't talked about that, so I'll just park it now if I get talked about that. But externally, in terms of of the vision and what I think it's important to build confidence, those are some of the things that I would think about considering in order to tackle some of the external challenges that a national director would actually be facing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to take you back to your appointment about the CD when you were in 2002 mm -hmm. appointed as director of public prosecutions for the province of KZN, being the first woman in the country to be appointed to that position. And the CD indicates that the administrative capacity in the office of the DDP at that stage included finance, procurement, human resources, core support services, and communications. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So just one point. Could you confirm that your appointment then was uh, in 2002, and then when did you leave the... Uh, the NPA? In 2009 was uh, when so I was appointed. appointed That's correct. Sorry, no problem. Um, well, let me say at the outset, um, when one becomes a manager, it's, it's a terrifying prospect. And um, I come in a prosecutor, and not having had much, much managerial experience, when you became the DPP, I remember in those, day, those days we didn't have internet, so I went to the library, and I borrowed this book, a bright yellow book, which said, help, exclamation mark, I am a manager. And so it's, it's a totally different skill set that you need from being a lawyer to being a manager. And so, so the good thing at that time is that the National Prosecuting Authority invested a lot in making lawyers managers because the National Director at that time was focusing very much on strategy development, on performance of the NPA, and in order to do these things you needed to have directors that were managers and were performance driven. And so we, um, we actually uh, went uh, for a, uh, an intensive five-week management course uh, which was held by Sandy, and so it, it dealt with all of those modules that you mentioned, um, HR, finance, etc. So there was a very, very strong focus on management, and those trainings uh, really helped in the management of those, um, you know, HR and, and finance, etc., in the DPP's office. So, and the, 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 the DPP's office, KZN, is quite a big office. I mean, KwaZulu Natal, I think there's about, now I'm not sure, there were about 600 prosecutors at the time um, when I was there. So it requires extensive management. But the good thing also is that the chief prosecutors also attended management courses. And so there was a strong emphasis on properly managing 
uh, not just prosecuting, but now managing and achieving objectives. So um, with regard to leadership skills, um, well, I th you know, um, I've, I've, I've had, um, and I'm, it's, you know, it's difficult to talk about one, what, one's, what one has done in a sort of modest way, so I'm struggling with this. But um, I have, uh, I was, as you see in my CV, I had leadership at, at an early stage in, in school, etc. In, and so I, I think that it, those, those things helped me. But in order to be a leader, it's different from being a manager. You need to inspire people. And you need to be able to, 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 for, to, for prosecutors to feel that they're doing a really good job. And prosecutors do an incredibly good job. And one of the things um, I think I used to, you know, sort of tell at, at the end of the year, we used to have these prosecutors' meetings all over the, 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 the province. And I'd go and speak to the prosecutors. And some of them said to me, it was hugely inspiring. So I'd like to think that I, I said things that really made them enjoy or, or doing what they did or feel that they were doing something really important. And they are. It is a hugely important job. And prosecutors, I think, again, they've been de demotivated for certain reasons. But I think that when prosecutors see that the NPA, again, is on the right track, I think it's very easy to motivate prosecutors because the job that we do is just, I think, one of the best jobs in the world. You know, you're fighting for justice for victims of atrocities. And so to be a prosecutor, you are the voice of the victim in court. You voice of, you're the voice of victims who can't speak because they've been killed. And so just being a prosecutor is just an incredible job. And prosecutors are so proud of being prosecutors. So I think it's just about you know, addressing, and, and I'm, not, I'm not under any illusion about the enormity of this job. So I think it's, it's, I'm going to have to draw on those inspirational qualities, and I hope I still have some of those, to, um, to kind of inspire prosecutors again, because they have such an incredible job to do in, I'd say, the new new South Africa, in terms of working with all other stakeholders to take control of our country again. And so I think prosecutors have a huge role to do. To do. And if I'm the head of the NPA, I will certainly ensure that prosecutors do their part in, in that way. In that regard. Thank you very much, Sir. Thank you. And Sir, notice. Thank you. Thank you, Sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me start. I remember you. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, I read the nomination letter by Mr. John Dunn from Queenstown. He's the center of the branch. Have you ever been to Queenstown? No. I've been to the Eastern Cape, but not to Queenstown. Not that I recall. <laughs> so it is one of the things that draws your service as much as it's This is why he said that he was a part of the government. Can I Thank you. 
Yes, I, I'm honoured, and I and you know to have been nominated, I, I feel extremely honoured, um, and 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 I appreciate uh, the, the the words uh, of Mr. Jordan in terms of a recognition of the the, the work that I did. Um, it's it's extremely difficult to speak about what what one has done so um, in the past, but no, I, <laughs> thank you, Minister. Um, I I. I suppose I can only comment that you know some of the one one of the cases that I was involved in uh, was involved the involved the the previous police commissioner Jackie Salebi, where the national director at that time um, appointed a com committee of four people to review the case uh, to decide whether a case should be brought before the the commissioner police commissioner and um, I was one of the um, four one of the one of the four panel members. The other three were external to the NPA, and I was the one person that was from the NPA that was involved. We, of course, um, recommended a prosecution in that case. So um, I have no other comment unless you have any specific questions. And also, you were involved in the inquiry that the Commission of Justice was the Commission. Yes. Yes, I was. Um, that was, um, it was a very, very interesting, um, you know, assignment at the time um, and um, very challenging as well uh, from many, many perspectives. Um, one is there was just, um, you know, it was, one was the substance of the matter which required investigations and which was challenging in itself uh, because it was so difficult to get the evidence, particularly from, from the Indians at the time. Uh, so there were, there were huge challenges there, and then there were other challenges that related to um, actually at the time we were we were looking at. I mean, it was a it was a high profile case. The media was was um, you know very interested. The people of South Africa were interested in this case, and so when the media was allowed, and I think that was the first time that the media was allowed in any kind of judicial proceedings, um, that was a challenge in itself because it kind of uh, you know it it threw you into another profile, into a very high profile situation, when you're kind of not really ready for it, because I was just a prosecutor doing my job, and then it became a very public case. But what it did is, I think it taught me at that time very quickly to learn to, to how you engage with the media. And so um, that, I think, was an, an experience that I learned that I find very useful, and I would find um, you know, if, this situ if I was appointed in this position. Thank you. I think it's important to understand, um, you know, all your the criminal justice professionals. And um, look, I worked for a very short time, um, you know, on on uh, in in private practice at the time. But of course, it gave me an understanding of of that aspect of law. But one of the things that drove me to prosecute is that I was also very scared of going to court. And so I thought, well, if you're afraid of something, just jump right into it. And um, so, you know, that was uh, one of the reasons why I went. But it certainly gave me an understanding of how a law firm works and, you know, how, how private practice actually operates. Yes. Now, I want to turn on to the last point. The question that you just alluded to, that really the descriptions of the last uh, constitutional judgment of the plan about the state of affairs in the NPA, the one of the is that. Now, so let's go to that. And also, you will know, the case that uh, we had some procedures. 
I think this will, this will be one of the big internal challenges um, in the NPA. And the fact of the matter is, I think the, the NPA is in crisis at the moment. There's, there's no two ways about it. And something needs to be done. And it's, it's, and it's, it's, the house is on fire, and you need to put the fire out, so to speak. And you can't now be kind of knocking on the door and explaining to people about, you know, how fire can be dangerous, and, you know, you need to, you need to get out. If you touch it, you're going to get burned. You need to just get the water and put out the fire. And so if you take that to the NPA, I mean, what do you do to deal with this crisis at this point? And I think it's going to have to be a step-by-step -step process because, you know, people talk about factions. We've been hearing a lot about uh, those words. But wh who are these factions? What are these factions? And I've been out of the NPA for a long time. So I think, you know, factions generally coalesce around ideas or thoughts about certain things. So certain people have thoughts uh, you know, about certain things. They think about something in this way and others think about it in another way. So I think the first thing one would have to do is to try to figure out what is it that's causing this division within the institution. And if you find that, you know, that, that the one, one part of it is, is they have thoughts that simply don't align with the vision and the values of the national, uh, of the NPA as, as I would see it at that time, then I think persons in that situation will have to look for, you know, to work elsewhere because they would not be able to align with the new vision of the NPA. That's the first scenario. The second scenario is if you look at what, what is actually causing the divisions and if you say, look, there's, you know, there's nothing that really goes against good governance principles, but they are, you know, sort of differences of views and that they, they both acceptable and you know you can maybe find common ground between them and see how you could actually come together um, and work together so those are the two scenarios and so I think it's it's going to have to be um, a lot of uh, listening and and trying to understand um, the the environment and then to to essentially um, I think those that do not have ideas and values that would actually uh, align with respect for the rule of law and 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 strong uh, government government um, strong principles of good governments governance I think will find it difficult in an institution um, the way I foresee the NPA so on the one hand you're going to have to deal with this at the at the level wherever however the factions are the information I get is that it's predominantly in the national office and in in their certain positions but I think we'll have to get the facts, and, 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 and you're going to have to take very, very uh, strong action against uh, persons that do not align to the, with the new vision of the NPA. But on the other hand, it's important that, you know, the NPA works as a, as a unit, and so in order for the national director to be successful, you need to have a really good team around the national director, and you need motivated prosecutors. And I, would, I, I can put my head on the block to say that more than 90% of the prosecutors are really motivated, love their jobs, love what they're doing, and will be aligned with the new vision in terms of the NPA being an independent institution with high ethical values. And so, you know, it will, it will have to be, you know, a step-by-step -step process, but those are the, the two key scenarios that I see.
problems or from whatever situation. Mm -hmm. And those people, they cause chaos because they would like to be on the inside. How would you deal with that situation? Perhaps I know that you would bring time to believe that. If you are aware of it, I would bring support to something. I'm not aware of it, but uh, what I can say is that, you know, I looked at the, at the annual report of the, of the NPA 2017-2018, uh, and the vacancy rate in the NPA is, uh, the average vacancy rate is sitting around 17%, and that's the average. So in some places it's, it's even, you know, over 20%. And it's very difficult to have effective and efficient service delivery if you have such high vacancy rates. But I know that they are, there's always been a problem with recruitment. So if this is a scenario, and I don't know the facts um, of this uh, and, the, and the agreement and the terms of the secondment, you know, but you know, one would have to look at whether these persons can't be in fact um, you know, included in the National Prosecuting Authority because there are huge vacancies and the, and the human resources are needed. So I think that might be one way of, of addressing that, but you know, uh, I'll have to get all the facts uh, in order to decide exactly what's possible if, if I am the person to have to deal with that. Good afternoon, Advocate. Uh, I, I can also say that I was quite impressed with your uh, dealing with the case study. Thank you. Uh, there's just one aspect. Was there, during your time as Director of Public Prosecution, uh, prosecutions uh, in, in KZP, any uh, serious problems between you and the staff members? There, there was a time when staff members made allegations of racism against me. It was public. It was in the newspaper. And um, so a short answer to that is yes. Um, it's, people make allegations for all kinds of reasons. And um, I, I, for me, it's, it's the past. And, you know, if, if I am appointed national director, those things don't matter to me anymore because, you know, people say things at a certain time and you just got to let it go. And, you know, as, as the new national director, uh, we'll have to simply move forward. And looking backwards, we'll only take an institution back. So I think it's really important that as if I'm the national director to put that aside, whatever the motivation for that was, I'm really, I, I, I'm, it doesn't matter to me anymore. It's about working together and ensuring that the, the huge task ahead of the national, uh, of the NPA is actually dealt with as a team. No, it wasn't, it wasn't me and the management. There were certain staff members um, that were unhappy. And yes, there were certain staff members that were unhappy, but um, it wasn't the management. And it, it related to the same issue that I just talked about now. It was all related to the same issue. <laughs> what was the result of the presentation process? Well... That's, that's, yeah, it's, um, it wasn't very satisfactory, actually, um, because, you know, allegations were made, and there was a facilitator, and, um, you know, nothing actually was properly resolved. Um, so I You know, people, you know, complain about certain things, speak to the various parties, and then they leave. And so, you know, nothing really, and, and I think that is very unsatisfactory. You know, if you start a process, there must be a process whereby it's taken to a proper conclusion and parties can see eye to eye, etc. But that unfortunately didn't happen. Was there a finding made by the or Yes, there was a report. There was a report brought out, and um, I think one of the recommendations of the report was that I attend anger management uh, training. So um, 
I think uh, I have, uh, I didn't think I had a problem actually controlling my anger, but uh, that was one of the recommendations. Um, I can't recall anything beyond that. I, I think there were, there were certainly certain staff members that were unhappy. And I'm finding it a bit difficult to speak about this because it's about reopening old wounds when if the person, if I get into this position, it's something that I would want to say it's, it's the past, let's move forward. But I think it's important for me to explain to this panel uh, the situation here because it seems to suggest that there was low morale. Um, I, I really don't want to speak to about staff members that are still in the office, so I'm finding it very difficult because I'm going to have to give details about certain things, and this is very public, and I think that is, that is not in the best interest of moving forward. But I'll try to deal with it in this way to say that, um, and this was confined to the, to the Peter Maritzburg office of, of the uh, DPP and not throughout the entire province. Um, there was certainly a group of staff members that were unhappy, um, and it was um, there were all kinds of allegations that were made. Um, there was a facilitator appointed. The, the point of it is that sometimes you don't understand why people say things. And so there were allegations made by staff members. Um, to be honest, I don't even know what those allegations really were. Because as I sit down here today, I try to think, what were the allegations? You know, there was nothing put forward to me to say, look, these are the allegations, this is why staff are unhappy, and you need to respond to them. That was never done. I never, I, you know, so I think it was in that sense somewhat unfair because it became very public, but there were no specific allegations that were made, and I was not given an opportunity to actually respond to those allegations. And so, it, you know, it, it's actually a pity because then you are able to address things properly. So, yeah, that was the situation. And the only reason why I mention it is it seems to me on your suspicions uh, as well that uh, your view is that there is a problem within the NPA and the such, specifically between people all between the members of Yes. Uh, do you, this, I suppose this uh, facilitation process was, was some time ago. It was over 10 years ago. Over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think you have in the meantime? From a I think, yes, I think I've developed a lot. I, um, I actually have started studying Indian philosophy and I wake up every morning at five o'clock and listen to lectures every morning. And it gives you an approach to life that allows you to take more, to manage your emotions, to not let things that happen in the world affect you, um, and to be able to, to become strong within yourself in terms of dealing with whatever the world throws at you. So I think it's, I find it very empowering. And so I listen to the lectures every morning um, and do a bit of yoga before I go to the office. So I go in a very, very calm state of mind. The environment at the ICC is extremely complicated. Um, so it allows me to, to accept what is out there, to deal with it to the extent that I, deal, that I need to, but also to manage myself. I think the important thing is it, it teaches me self-management and the ability to deal with, uh, constructively, with what life has to throw at you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Yes, 
afternoon. Thank you. If it's still, uh, yeah, if it's still, I don't know. When you were, when you were still with the team or with the institution, did you see this study in the asking? Oh, absolutely. Because, um, I mean, prior to the, to the first national director being appointed, there was no um, real strategy focused approach in the NPA. Um, I remember the national director at the time asked me, where was your strategy? And I said to him, it's in my head. I mean, that was uh, crazy. We just didn't, it was not the way we, we did business. But that all changed when the, the first national director took office and then, you know, started ensuring that we had proper objectives that were set out for the National Prosecuting Authority and to ensure that there was, that these, there was proper monitoring in terms of us trying to achieve these objectives. And it was a very, very strong performance-focused approach in the National Prosecuting Authority. So I think what is good at the time is that for the first time we started looking at how an organization can be successful. What are the different aspects of the strategy? How do you look at your core business of, of, of prosecuting? What do you need to, to do to enhance that? How do you look at who are your key stakeholders that you need to work with? How do you actually engage with these stakeholders to ensure that you get maximum cooperation from them? Um, victims was a, was a really important. We, during that period, we actually, for the first time, started looking at who is the customer of the NPA? Who do we actually serve? Because we are public servants. I think that's hugely important. We serve the public first and foremost. And so when we developed the strategy, we started looking at who, who is our customer. And so once you know who your customer is, you can ensure that whatever you develop in order to serve your customer well is properly tailored to meet the needs of your customer. So it's certainly after we started developing the strategy, I, st I don't know if that strategy is still in place, but each of the divisions, we had the national strategy and then each of the divisions had to develop their own uh, plans to align with that strategy. And so um, I think it certainly focused the efforts of the uh, prosecution in terms of we knew clearly what we, needed to what we needed to achieve, what were the goals, and then we had to develop plans in terms of how to achieve it. And that was the first time that we did it in the NPA. Yes, that's right. So I want you to, to name the, the experience that you grew when you participated in coming up with the strategy in many things and also the policy development that you have to do at the ICC and tell us how that experience will assist this country if it can be developed in to have the 
I think firstly, um, just the whole approach to developing a strategy at that point, um, as I said, it actually helped us to clearly identify goals. Um, firstly, you have your vision, your mission, and then from that, what are your goals? What are your key goals? And then, and I think they're going to be some very specific one that the national director will have to deal with, given the, given the situation in the NPA and in the external environment, in the broader criminal justice system. So that certainly, those, those exercises helped me to start thinking strategically. And the, the office, the NPA at that time did um, profiles of people. You know, you had to do these tests in order to, to determine where you stood, where your profile was, whether you are a person who did operational, uh, whether you are at a business or supervisory level, business and strategic. And my assessment came up at, at the, the business strategy level, you know, in terms of your, your thinking and approach. So I have always sort of having not prosecuted in courts for a long time, and even at the ICC now, um, the, the work that the, Office of the, that the legal advisory section does is in addition to policy drafting, you also uh, contribute as a member of XCOM, I would contribute to development of the strategy at the NPA as well. So my, sorry, at the ICC. So in fact, my experience here in South Africa helped me very much to actually, in, in my work at the ICC, in terms of being involved in, in strategy development. And certainly, in t it also helped me in terms of developing policies there. But now, I think what's, you know, you, you stop prosecuting, you're not a rank and file prosecutor anymore. You actually start looking at building institutions. And part of what, in addition to developing policies, uh, at, the, at the Office of the Prosecutor, we also looked at how we could strengthen the lessons learned system to kind of move towards a learning organization so that you, we, we developed an electronic lessons learned system so that you, you have after action reviews, you look at what worked properly, what didn't work so well, you know, what were those, you know, spectacular failures that you never want to happen again, what were those things that really worked well. So those lessons as well, the development of that system I think will very much assist me in terms of looking at the position in South Africa and how we can actually learn from our experiences and how we can develop strategies properly because I think the new national director is going to have to have a strategic team around him or her and they're going to have to think very, very carefully about how to deal with the internal dynamics as well as the external uh, broader criminal justice community. So that will certainly be very, very useful in terms of developing that. I think it's going to be important for, for us as prosecutors, and again, I always you know, punctuate this with, a, with saying that uh, most of the prosecutors, I think, are still very committed prosecutors. So I don't want to make it seem like you know, all the prosecutors now need to, again, align with this vision. But I didn't, uh, just, to, just to correct um, the record, it's not, I didn't say we should change the, the, the mission. I think it's a great mission that the NPA had. But I said, in addition, there has to be this new vision in terms of the credibility and the trust of the institution that we need to build. 
So prosecutors, as I say, most of them are really aligned to that already. They love what they do. They are feel that they are bringing some level of justice to people that have been violated in so many ways. So I think all that the prosecution needs is leadership from the top that they can see aligns with those values, in fact, that they have a leader that understands, a leader that's going to take independent decisions. And I think that in itself will be hugely motivating for prosecutors to do their, their work properly. I think we also need to perhaps develop an attitude, um, you know, as prosecutors to actually being, being less uh, selfish, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, but in terms of looking inwardly, always about, you know, what's in it for me, and look a little more outwardly in terms of what can I do for somebody else without expect, expecting anything in return. And I think with that kind of attitude, you know, when you know that you are doing something good for somebody, you're helping someone, I think it's, and it gives you incredible job satisfaction. And, and maybe I should just mention, you know, I, I'm here, I accepted the, the nomination to, to be here for this interview. Um, I, I have, you know, let, let me step outside of myself for a moment. Um, the position, materially, there's, it's a very good position that this person holds in the, in, at, the, at the ICC. Materially, very comfortable. Um, as far as peace of mind, very comfortable. As far as uh, various personal issues, very comfortable. There's, what is it that drives this person to come and say, I am prepared to be considered for the national director? There's only one thing, and that is a commitment and a, an obligation that the person feels to contribute in some small way when the country says, come and help. I think it's so important that those of us that have comfortable lives elsewhere do put ourselves in a position and make ourselves available. It's got to be all hands on deck. So we've got to put aside some of our personal comforts, and that is the only reason why this person is prepared to say, consider me. There's, there's a, this is jumping into a shark tank. Peace of mind is priceless, and that is what one has in Holland where you have to where, where theft of bicycles is really a, a, a huge problem. So um, just to say that I think, you know, getting, getting back to your, to, your, to your question, I think it's, it's that kind of attitude that we as prosecutors need to inculcate a bit more so that we know there's a higher cause that we're actually striving for. It's not just about us. It's about victims. It's about the people of this country. We brought justice for victims on individual cases. Now the entire country is almost like a victim, and we need to actually work together to ensure that we can, we can address the problems that are. And not alone, let me again emphasize, the national director of the NPA cannot do it alone. It's got to be, as I outlined earlier, with cooperative spirit, working with all the relevant stakeholders, and trying to together make a difference. No, that's not what I'm saying. Definitely not. Because I think it's important that the national director understands the situation. And so you have to, as I explained, you know, there's people talk about factions. Uh, you need to understand what exactly is it. What are the differences in thinking that makes people align? And are those so irreconcilable in terms of coming together? So there's got to be a thorough understanding of what is underlying this problem before you can actually then take very, very clear and determinative action with regard to how that's going to be addressed. But there has to be a thorough understanding of what the situation is first. The, the issue raised by uh, only <coughs> uh, Right. Mm 
As I said, the allegations were never really put to me, you know, in terms of understanding what exactly is it that's underlying this, these allegations. Because from a personal perspective, I didn't have any problems with, with staff members of any race in the office. I treated them all fairly. I treated them, you know, no differently from another race. So I couldn't understand what was underlying that. For me, it was an absolute shock and a confusion. I was absolutely horrified when those allegations were made because I said, what is underlying this? What am I doing? So I still don't understand what exactly those, those allegations related to because as far as I was concerned, I thought I, I, I actually empowered people that were previously disadvantaged in that particular office to actually, um, you know, in terms of, of promoting persons that were previously disadvantaged to higher positions in the office, um, and so I couldn't understand what was underlying it, and I still don't know. And that's what makes it very difficult to, to actually... There was a report, as, as advocate said, you know, there was a facilitator, but I, you know, there was no allegations that I could say, this is what I need to respond to, because it was just, you know, unclear what was underlying those accusations. There's nothing. No, I'm not. It's Ms. Batoy. Oh, it's Shamila. Please call me Shamila. It's fine. Yes, yes, that's what I said. Now, what good is the decision that has been made if it's not implemented? What happens? This is in here today. Certain individuals, where decisions were taken and were not implemented, and now those individuals are somewhere in the I'm, I'm not aware of what each, each case has got to be looked at according to the particular circumstances. And if, for example, in my discussion with the, with the president, I think it's important to understand that the, what I was trying to put across is that national directors cannot simply take decisions and create chaos in a country. You have to ensure that the timing of your decision is properly managed. It doesn't mean it's got to be an, an unreasonable for example, there'll have to be some agreement about a reasonable time that would allow the decision to be implemented as well as ensure that there's minimal, minimal uh, damage as far as potential um, investments or the, the economy of the country is not impacted negatively too much. But the example that you gave me, for example, um, if, if the facts show that there's a possibility that the person's implicated could leave the country, then they will have to be, the decisions will have to be implemented because then you would completely, the prosecution will not be possible. So it's all fact specific. And in that instance, um, I would think the, you know, the decision will have to be implemented um, as soon as possible to ensure that the persons don't leave the country. 
the NPA as as you 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 say that you said state of affairs uh, in NPA current action. Well, that's the impression I get. Yes, that's right. Well, I heard from them as well. I had been reading about things, but that was, yes, so, that's great. Uh, in your discussion, you think that messy picture of the city of West Indy and PA, there might be more support for the messy state of the I think it's, I've, I've said a few things. I've said it's a messy state of affairs. I said it's a crisis. I've said, I, I think there's problems in the NPA that need to be addressed. I appreciate that because uh, uh, you being from the outside uh, of the NPA, like the, all those that are within the NPA that they can never get characterized as a lot of this in the NPA in the manner in which you understand that. I appreciate that. Let's just uh, not coming from the uh, the Aren't you being a little bit uh, invasive on the issue that uh, I believe the city has raised? Isn't it the truth that, 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 that <coughs> the dissatisfaction of the previous assembly, at the heart of that previous was race relations between yourself and the those were, those were the allegations, that's right. No, absolutely. I mean, those allegations were that it was racism. But what underlied those allegations, I, I don't know. Because they were not specifically that you did this on this particular day, which meant you treated somebody differently. And then you could explain it. There was none of that detail about those allegations. So I don't know. I know the allegations of racism was made, but what actually was underlying that, I still have no idea. It's a small team, yes. Small team. Yes. Uh, army. Team of five. Uh, different nationals? Yes, it's a very diverse uh, group. At the moment, I have, uh, well, not I have, those I'm the team is a Dutch male, a Russian female, uh, a Malaysian female, and a Ugandan female. We have interns that work in the office that report to them. Yes, but is there any there any race relations issue in that community? No, never. And that has been going for all time. I've been there for nine years now. The vision that you that you explain going into the NPA, into the NPA, into the NPA, into the NPA, and then Russia. Mm-hmm. I'm just a little bit worried about you going in the NPA Right. But that vision somehow has a space to accommodate the functions within the NPA. And if you want to give a hearing here to these functions, why would you care about those functions if you did not wear a solid version that you want to drive everybody on board? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do you care about the functions? Why is it just not to understand about the functions? Because there's divisions in the office, from what I hear. I'm not there. My understanding is that there's divisions. And if you want a team to move together with this new vision, and if there's still these underlying um, factions within the office, it's going to create, you're not going to be able to work as a team. So I think it's important that the entire office works as a team. So it it will therefore be important to understand what is underlying this. Is it something that is completely, is is the thinking on one side completely something that cannot be in line to the new vision, in in which case it's going to be impossible to work with those people. But if, as I said, the second scenario is, after you, you, you look into the issue, that 
even though people have, have different views about something, that it's still aligned, you can find common ground and it's still aligned to that vision, you can then find the common ground and move together as a team. I think if you don't understand that, you're going to be, you're going to have a dysfunctional office where people are not going to be able to work as a team. So I think it's important to understand that in terms of moving forward. Yes. None at all, and she's a reference. You can you can call her. Yes. Yes, that's correct. No, I have no previous convictions. No, I have no questions. So that brings us to the end of your interview. If you want to give questions to the presidency of the outcome of this interview. Thank you. I'm glad that's over. <laughs> wow. I thought this was bad. Thank you very much to the panel. Don't decide.
Well, uh, we just had Advocate Shamila. She is done right now, and of course she was the final candidate. Remember that initially there were 12 candidates, but after the MP um, Dennis Breitenbach pulled out, we were left with 11. So today was the final day, and we're done with the interviews. Right now I'm joined by the chairperson of the panel that has been tasked with this very important uh, job, Minister, of trying to help the President appoint a person who is fit and proper. Yes, indeed, it has been a very exciting uh, period, and I want to thank the President for having confidence in me and other other members of the Senate to assist me to identify those uh, people who can be appointed by him as the National Director of Public Prosecutions. As I've just said, that was the last candidate. Now, we're going to be going into the private session where we're going to be evaluating, assessing, and deciding on the short list for the president of three to four minutes. What exactly is it that um, the panel will be looking at? We'll be assessing each and every candidate in terms of their performance in this interview, plus their background as well. As you have noticed, we took copious notes. So I'm going to be comparing the strengths and weaknesses of these candidates so that we can be able to ensure that the final three or four are the ones that we believe that the president can be able to appoint one of them. As a minister of uh, a former minister of justice and constitutional development, how important is it to get somebody who's fit and proper into that position? Yes, indeed. You can realize that the main focus of this interview was to make sure that section 179 of the constitution has to be identified a fit and proper person who's fearlessly independent of any political, judicial, or public influence who must be guided by the constitution ensure that he takes, she, he takes decisions independently without fear, aid, or prejudice. From your personal observation, where have things gone wrong with the MPA? Well, uh, that's what I'm going to be evaluating, <laughs> and I'm sure you heard what people are saying. That's why we need to ensure that those, that person who is identified by the president is the one who can fix things for the Minister, I just want to offer you a right to reply. This is the issues around um, some of the panelists not recusing themselves, like Advocate Sidia, for instance, when they well, of John To answer, to answer in, a, in a short hand, there is no panel member of the computer in this interview. Okay, and yourself, Minister. Indeed. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Minister of, uh, Minister of Energy, there, who was the chairperson of uh, the panel that was uh, looking into. Um, some of the remarks that have been made by the candidates and looking for the person who is fit and proper um, to lead the NPA.